love of God, self, neighbor, and stranger enables us, enables us to more fully to reflect God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Hear these words from Mark 12, 28 to 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one neighbor, one's neighbor as oneself, there is much, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. This is the word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. So the first time I preached on this particular content, well, I was at a licensing school, which was the first step in being appointed as a minister in the United Methodist Church. And I thought, great, this will be easy. <laughs> so I thought. <laughs> so let's try it again today and see where we go. This week's lectionary offers us two stories about love. In the first that Peggy just read so beautifully for us, a scribe comes to Jesus and asks, which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus responds with an answer most of us know so well we can recite it as easily as the Lord's Prayer. The first commandment is to love. To love God with our entire beings and our neighbors as ourselves. As Mark's Gospel recounts, the scribe agrees and elaborates on Jesus' answer with a surprising insight of his own, understanding now that Jesus and the scribe are about this close together in normal life. The scribe says, to love God and neighbor is much more important that, than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Prioritizing love is more important than piety. Think of the Pharisees and the scribes and what they've been saying to Jesus for a while now. More important than piety or ritual or tradition or penance or even religion. When Jesus hears those wise words, he says, you are not far from the kingdom of God, a kingdom where... Love is actionable. Love is lived. Love is inclusive of all, encompassing both the human and the divine. And Mark's gospel tells us that at this, all of those listening fell silent, not daring to ask Jesus another question. I can try following that up. But perhaps it's because this love is so much more than romance or emotion or words expressed in Sunday worship or pleasantries exchanged at the grocery store or kindness shared across a backyard fence. All of those are elements of what Jesus is talking about. But this love is more than rote or feeling. This is biblical love. It is a path we are asked to travel, literally walking in love. Now, about this time, I would step out and give you some personal example or anecdotal story to get us into the rhythm, but instead I'd like to share the second story that I referred to. We didn't read it as a scripture, uh, reading ahead of today's message. Instead, it is the message. So I'd like to offer you the following story inspired by Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. It's a section, second lectionary reading for today, and it offers what this love can look like. We're going to enter in to hear a bit about the beginning of Ruth's story. The story goes like this. In the days 
When the judges ruled over Israel, a time when everyone did what was right in their own eyes, when strong, long-haired, so-called heroes killed more people by dying than by living, a terrible famine came on the land. And as a result of this famine, a man from Bethlehem, a name that ironically means house of food, left that land and took his family, wife, and two sons to Moab, a country east of Israel and much higher in elevation, with the hope of food. The man was Elimelech, which means my God is king. His wife is Naomi, whose name means pleasant. And he has his two sons with him, Malin and Chilion, and we don't know what their names mean. Not germane to the story. Here's the thing, though. Now they're in Moab in hope of food, and another famine hits that country. Somewhere in that timeline, Elimelech dies, leaving Naomi, a foreign widow, left with her two sons. Now, a woman without a man in the ancient world was disconnected from society and possessed few rights for goods and service in any culture, let alone a foreign one. So this was an even more difficult situation for Naomi, living in a foreign land. In her widowhood, her hope then lay in these two sons. After some time, they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. And they lived together in Moab with Naomi for about 10 years. And then the worst of the worst happened as both sons, like their father, also died. So now we have three widows, Naomi, a foreigner, and her, her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, both of whom are childless. Naomi doesn't see any further future for herself in Moab. And hearing that the famine has ended in her homeland, she makes a decision to turn westward and return to the land of Israel. Now, her daughters-in-law, being faithful and dutiful women, are determined to go with her. But Naomi isn't having it. She sternly charges the girls to go back to their own families, their own mom. You are in your hometown. You are in your home country. If you come with me, it will not go well for you. Please go back to your mothers and your families. Find new husbands. May Yahweh make for you a steadfast, unbreakable love, just as you have made with your my sons and with me. Yahweh grant you rest and security, each of you in the house of your husband, meaning they would go back and marry and begin again. Clearly, Naomi is demanding that they stay where they are in a land they're familiar with, with husbands that are coming from that culture and country. She then kisses them both goodbye, and as you can imagine, it's an emotional conversation. And she turns to leave, and they say to her, no, we'll go back with you to your people. One more time, Naomi says. Return home, my daughters, why would you come with me? I'm not going to have any more sons, so who would become your husbands if you came with me? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and produced two more sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried until they were old enough to marry? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, this situation, because I feel that God's hand has turned against me. Now they all weep again. And then Orpah kisses her mother-in-law goodbye, returns to her family, but Ruth stays. The Bible says, the verses say, Ruth clung to her. This word clung has a long history in Israel. Its most famous use may be in Genesis 2, where we are told that a man clings to his woman and they become one flesh in this way. So it's a really intimate verb, expressing the deepest devotion and unwillingness to let go under any circumstances. This is Ruth, a Moabite, talking to her mother-in-law, an Israelite, saying, I won't leave you. I will cling to you. And Naomi is astonished. One more time, because you know how we moms are when we get ready. 
Have you not heard what I've been saying? You are a woman, strike one. You are a widow, strike two. And you are a foreigner, strike three, and you're out. Look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her God, so please go back with her. But Ruth does not. Instead, she then utters these words that include one of the most powerful and perhaps familiar expressions of love lived that we know. She begins by saying, do not force me to abandon you or turn back from following you. Whether, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and be buried. May Yahweh do anything at all to me, and even more, if death parts me from you. In this profound expression of love and commitment, Ruth offers her current life and her constant companionship, her Moabite nationality, her Moabite religious training and conviction, her death, her burial, her future, in short, all that she has been, is, or will ever be. Though we often hear this pledge in modern-day marriage liturgies in context, this vow Ruth makes to Naomi isn't about some fresh-faced bride on her wedding day, nor is it the pledge young, ardent lovers might make when their love is new or hopeful or full of untested promise. This is an offer that far exceeds anything we can imagine. It's also offered at a time when her companion Naomi is at her lowest, bereft and depleted and forlorn and bitter, imagining that the God she thought she knew has withdrawn his love and cursed her with unspeakable suffering. Ruth's in a similar position. It would have been easy to walk away and go, oh, yeah, I don't need to be hooked up with that. Surely we can find somewhere else to be. But her vow is of one grief-stricken, traumatized, and profoundly vulnerable woman to another. She knows that leaving Moab with her mother-in-law and traveling to Judah will render her an unwelcome foreigner in a culture that has a history of expelling foreign women as dangerous. She knows that money will be scarce, her prospects for remarriage uncertain, and any further reunion with her birth family unlikely. She knows that sticking with Naomi will require a reordering of her life, and yet she puts her legitimate worries and losses and fears aside and vows to love Naomi as she loves herself. I wonder if the people listening to Jesus and the scribe today conjured this story, remembered Ruth's version of love, and if perhaps that's what silenced them in Mark's story centuries later. When Ruth pledges to walk in love with Naomi, she knows her path will be jagged, unfamiliar, costly, and yet, as we know from the end of Ruth and Naomi's story, it is also the path that leads to healing and redemption, and joy, and new life. Ruth's story in these verses and her commitment to love lived embody Jesus' words, the kingdom of God revealed as she and we opt to live in love, lived for one another in obedience to that first and greatest commandment, even when the path is hilly or thorny or arduous. Because as we do that, as we consistently practice our way into always loving God with everything and our neighbors ourselves, we may find ourselves in situations like Ruth's more than once. And as we live our way through those situations, feel that healing, that rege redemption, that opening up, that walking this path can give us. If we connect this back to the first story of Jesus and the scribe, there are these words excerpted from, impressed by a gentleman named Ken Rooks. He says, the scribe was impressed. This itinerant teacher clearly was no fool. He was asking a question, not to test Jesus, not to put him in any kind of jeopardy. He just wanted to know the answer. 
an honest question. He asks, which of all the commandments is the first of all? Well, the first is here, Israel, the Lord God is one. Love God with all your being. And wait, there's a second. Your love for God becomes real in loving others. As you love yourself, so you must love your neighbor. It's all about love. To love completely is the way to true life. So may we be as Ruth, as Christ, as disciples and beloved children of God walking the path of love lived full out for God, neighbor, and ourselves. Amen.